I'm Professor David Wilson. As a criminologist, I'm often asked, what's it like to interview a murderer? This is a tape-recorded interview. The date is 11 17 of 84. To answer this question, I'm going to take you on a journey into the dark heart of the police interrogation room. Using cutting-edge lip-sync technology, we'll bring to life the actual tape confessions of some of the world's most notorious killers. I put tape on her mouth, held it there so she couldn't breathe. And bring you face to face with evil. I felt sick looking at him, knowing what he did. And along with forensic psychologist, Professor Michael Brooks, I'll analyze their interviews in unparalleled detail. Her skull gave way a little bit. She was there immediately unconscious. Their wicked words, now seen spoken for the very first time, will never be forgotten. So I didn't suggest to him that we kill her on Sunday, but I knew that she, I knew that she had to be gone. In today's episode, we hear an extraordinary confession within an absolute masterclass in police interviewing technique, perhaps the best I've ever examined. The man sitting in the police interrogation room is a British expat. Born in Bromsgrove in Worcestershire, he moved to Canada when he was young. A glittering military career was to follow. He became a pilot who flew the Queen and rose through the ranks to become commander of Canada's largest Air Force base. But he lived a dark and deadly double life. He was a voyeur, a predator and a sexual sadist whose sick fantasies culminated in the murder of two beautiful young women. The interrogator is Detective Sergeant Jim Smith. His soft-spoken, relaxed manner belies the fact that he's the leading light in the Canadian Police's Behavioural Science Unit, which applies offender profiling and forensic psychiatry to criminal interrogations. It starts with the police interrogator's version of small talk. The subject is not even under arrest and he's been given no prior indication of why he's been asked to speak to the police. But the conversation quickly turns to the violent murders of 27-year-old Jessica Lloyd and 38-year-old Corporal Marie Franz Como. Both women had been violently assaulted and asphyxiated. After 10 gruelling hours, all of the subject's composure collapses. Denial turns to desperation and he'll leave the room a confessed murderer. His fall from grace is a fascinating insight into police tactics, the power of persuasion, and pure evil. Who is this once high-flying military man, now reduced to a prison number? Colonel Russell Williams. One quiet Sunday afternoon in February 2010, Ontario Police invited a very distinguished local man to come into the station for an informal chat. He wasn't under arrest, but he was under suspicion. His name was Colonel Russell Williams. A local woman by the name of Jessica Lloyd had gone missing. Police suspected she may have been abducted or even murdered in the same way another woman by the name of Marie Franz Como had been some six months earlier. As the commander of Trenton Air Base, stationed to over 3,000 young men in the Canadian Air Force, Russell thought he was being asked to help police with their search for a suspect, just as he had done so in the past. 
but as he sat down in the police interview room, he could have had no idea that striding up along the corridor to meet him was Detective Jim Smith. And as the tape recorder rolled, the scene was about to be set to one of the most extraordinary police interviews in history. So that's a little microphone, just yeah. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is audio taped. Check. Uh, you ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? Or? I have never been interviewed like this. Oh, no? Okay. Interviewed by NIS for top secret clearance. Oh, yeah? All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, an investigation like this. I have a simple rule when I talk to people. I treat everybody with respect. Okay. okay. You're obviously not under arrest here today. Okay. Yep. Anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Well, you got the impression when he started that he was um, bulletproof, that he was a pillar of the community, and that he would just go in, assist the police, um, show, that he, show himself to be that pillar of the community. Um, can't understand why you've picked on me, but here I am to help you in whatever way I can. When you look at his behavior, you see a man casual, confident, chewing gum, um, being quite chatty and informal with the interviewers. Um, and I think that some of it was bravado. The most fascinating thing to me was the interview itself, which was brilliantly conducted. There were, there were no other people in the room apart from the suspect and the interviewer. But the, the way the officer conducted the interview was absolutely outstanding. I can't think of a better interview. His use of pauses, silences, um, empathy, it was just outstanding. And to watch a man come in who was a colonel in the, in the Air Force um, on top of his game, to watch him crumble into full confession and self-pity was, was textbook stuff. As Russell Williams sat across the table, Jim Smith began to artfully outline the real reasons why the Colonel was there. In uh, November of 2009, yeah. a young lady by the name of Marie France Como um, yeah. Yeah, was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And uh, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. Then, most recently, we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Essentially, uh, there was a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Yes, I, I would yes. have to say there is a, a connection, yeah. Given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to, uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch CSI occasionally, yes. Okay, so you have an idea of obviously the forensic capabilities, things like that are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation. What uh, What do you need? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions? Yeah. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? This would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Well, uh, bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Because it's tough to undo the rumor mill once it gets started. It's almost a kind of defer to rank posture, uh, which the colonel would put the colonel at ease and uh, lead him to believe that uh, this is someone who is deferring to him. Um, but it's also reassuring the, um, that he is not being challenged immediately, that this is not someone who is a formidable adversary necessarily. So I think he'd be reassured by that. He has got a, a total regard for authority. He's a very authoritative figure. Um, but at the same time, I, I think this is often feeds into a serial offenders' um, a mental outlook, which is they are actually better than everyone else. They are one step ahead of everyone else. So he can be this prominent public figure, but at the same time, he's so clever and so smart. Um, he can stay one step ahead forever and no one will ever work out that he's, he's got this secret side to himself. 
I'm joined by Professor Michael Brooks. In his long and illustrious career as a prison psychologist, Michael has sat and listened to many murderers and experienced firsthand the mind games they play. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? Well, this is an interview that's setting the scene and Williams is very keen to establish his supposed dominance over the interviewer, isn't he? He is, yes. D did you pick up this idea that uh, the last time um, he'd been interviewed, or the only time he'd been interviewed was when he was to get top security clearance. How would you characterize Williams in this interview? Well, in that particular moment, he's wanting to assert who he is, um, to, in a sense, try and perhaps pull rank over the I interviewer. Um, but the interviewer is not interested in that. I think this interviewer, this police interviewer, is very, very clever. Uh, the reason why he's been brought in on a Sunday, everything is under the radar. He's trying to reassure Williams that things are fine and that uh, everything could go smoothly. On the one hand, yes. But on the other, he's, he's just being very careful in terms of um, setting the scene, providing some reassurance. It turns out to be false reassurance um, because of the ability with which she conducts the interview, but not putting um, Williams under any undue anxiety to begin with. Because that would be a danger, wouldn't it? In, in that way, Williams would then become um, not conducive to be, being interviewed. He'd become unproductive. He, he may even become hostile. He may even walk away. There are very few killers in, in the world today, or even in history, that we can look at and say, this person had it all. This person had everything. He had finances, he had a great career, he had homes, he had respect, he had a lot. I think that is something which makes him an extraordinary and very un unusual uh, killer. He's not, he's not a lorry driver, he's not unemployed, he, he, he's a prominent figure who manages to juggle this this secret life um, and it, it, it very rarely happens that you get somebody in such a position carrying out such a long reign of, of terror. This is a man who captained aircraft that had taken people like the Queen across Canada. This is a man who everybody respected to the highest security level possible so he had a big remit and a big professional standard that he had to maintain and keep. It also in the darker side allowed him an obvious shadow or a, a veil over his dark secret. And that dark secret was something that was about to emerge. Williams has been in the interview room now for almost three hours. He's given little away, only appearing to listen diligently to everything his interrogator, Detective Sergeant Jim Smith, has to say. But little by little, Without ever openly accusing Williams of any of the crimes, Smith has revealed detail after detail that lets the Colonel know the game is up. But at this stage, it's still far from clear if he'll confess. But like everything else in this extraordinary story, an even more remarkable confession, the tipping point comes in the most unlikely and unexpected manner. When Williams does crack, it's for the most banal of reasons. He's worried about how upset his wife will be if the police tear apart their dream home in search of clues. What's really going on here? Is it significant when Detective Jim Smith asks him, does he want to be labeled a cold-blooded psychopath? Does this become the catalyst for him to reveal every horrifying detail of his murders? Starting with the death of a woman who had respected him, trusted him, and even worked alongside him, Corporal Marie Franz Como. As the interview progresses, Detective Jim Smith starts toying with Williams. It comes in the form of asking a seemingly random question about the tires he uses on his 4x4. But there's nothing random about Smith or his line of questioning. Have you ever visited uh, uh, Marie Franz Como at her residence? No. Okay. 
All right. Um, so you're quite positive there would be no reason why your DNA would be in any Absolutely. of those locations. Okay. Um, did you know Jessica Lloyd even in passing for any reason? No, I didn't hear, hear her name until it was on the news. All right. Just want to make sure I'm covering all the bases here. Okay. What kind of tires do you have on your Pathfinder? I think um, I think they're Toyo. So you're quite positive there would be no reason why your DNA would be in any of those locations. The interviewer is beginning to put some pressure on Williams in relation to evidence that might link him to these two women. He's still pretty adamant that there would be no evidence that would link him, isn't he? Yeah, and, and he's still on the defensive in terms of not admitting to anything. But what the interviewer is very skillfully doing is introducing the information that he might have um, in terms of um, the offences and in terms of um, the, the information about the perpetrator. He's very sophisticated in simply deflecting all of those away, isn't he? Because at the moment he's thinking this is all supposition. I, I'm not sure actually yet what you do know, but I'm not going to indicate um, anything about what I know until you sh sh indicate that you um, have got more substantial information. The curious thing about this case as well is DNA and any forensic work, scientific work that we have now currently, didn't solve this case. And in fact, when the police and investigating authorities were looking into it, and they were going onto the base and taking swabs and speaking to people and investigating people, the man who was authorising that was the man who was committing the crimes. So he was the person in the perfect situation. And of course, nobody in the police would dare question him. And what it was in the end, it was a tyre track and a footprint in the soil that actually caught this man. What they do is they, they mount road checks uh, under the guise of looking for drink drivers, but in fact they're checking people's tyres and they latch on to the fact that he's, he's driving this car and uh, he's driving this vehicle and it's got uh, the same tyre tread. Would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property uh, that they identified um, a set of tire tracks uh, to the north of her property. Um, looks as if the vehicle left the road mm -hmm. and uh, drove along the north tree line of, of uh, Jessica Lloyd's property. Okay. okay. They examined those tire tracks. Mm -hmm. They identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah. This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Yeah. Okay. This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot. Yeah. Just a little while ago. Okay. Yeah. Footwear impressions are very much like. Uh, like fingerprint comparisons, okay? You take a look at this print. These are identical. Okay. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Footwear impressions are very much like uh, like fingerprint comparisons. He's actually worn the pair of shoes that he wore when he murdered Jessica Lloyd to the interview itself. I mean, uh, what's going on there? Is that stupidity? Is it sang froid? How, how would you characterize it? Well, there's, there's the confidence, but also the, the, the two personas, the, the, the military man plus as opposed to the offender. So at the moment he's, he, he's as the, the military man and doesn't and hasn't um, made the connection between the two 
with, with regards to this interview process. And what the interviewer is very skillfully doing is, being, is laying down the evidence that means that he has to move from being the military man to the offender and to admit to that. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is, this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm. Russell, mm. listen to me for a second, okay? When that evidence comes in, your credibility is gone, okay? Because this is how credibility works, all right? You want discretion. We need to have some honesty. The interviewer returns to this idea of credibility, the idea of credibility and how that seems to press a button in Williams. Why, why is credibility important to him? Because credibility is, is one of the key um, values and characteristics of Williams as a military man. And so what he's wanting him to do is to admit to, to what's taken place for his own credibility. There's a, a risk there, isn't there, Michael? Because I accept entirely that the interviewer is appealing to the sense of um, integrity that somebody with this kind of rank in the Royal Canadian Air Force uh, must have had. But equally, doesn't the fact that Williams has risen so high, has been so successful in the military, allow him to mask his feelings more successfully? To keep control of his emotions? Yes, it does. I mean, and, and that's why he's been able, for, for a long period of his life, to um, sus subsume his um, two personas, um, the, the two patterns of behaviour. You, you, you used the phrase, two personas. Are you implying, I, don't, I know you're not, but just so that for the sake that everybody's clear, you're not implying he's schizophrenic, are you? No, no but, but, but the, the, there's the offending behaviour um, that, that he undertakes, and then there's this military, highly successful military c career. I'm struggling with how upset my life is right now. Russ, what are you looking for? By the time he's presented with the incontrovertible evidence, Colonel Williams recognises that for him, all is lost. All that remains of who he was and his life previously is his wife and, 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 and their family home. So for them then to threaten to take away the one remaining um, uh, part of his life um, was just too much and, and he caved. I want to um, minimize the impact on my wife. So do I. So how do we do that? Well, we start by telling the truth. Okay. So where is she? Get him out. Okay, is she close to a road? Yep. All right. Is it something where is she is she buried or is she somewhere where if you walk there you would you would fairly easily see her? It's here. How did you leave her? I just left her tucked behind a, uh, a fairly large rock. There's a number of reasons perhaps why he admitted so quickly without um, uh, too much pressure on him. One is that it may be that he was actually ready, he needed to, you know, he was actually relieved, it gave him a sense of release. It may be that actually because he's used to being in the military, there's, um, he has some sort of respect for authority, you know, and this is a different type of authority, but he's in police custody, um, they're in control, um, and maybe he's responding to that in terms of his military background. It's a military debrief. 
he understands that that's what he has to do now. His options have been reduced. You can see him flicking through his manual of, of options and being reduced to saying, fine, um, you have me, I will now tell you what you need to know. Do you want to work forwards or backwards? Doesn't matter. Marie France uh, Como. Marie France Como had been a flight corporal who had worked alongside the colonel. The moment he first saw her would prove to be the beginning of ultimately a deadly fixation. There was an open window in the basement of her uh, her house. I think when you look at this man, because of the, the service discipline he's got and the immaculate planning that would need to go into anything he was doing within his day job, that reflected in the way he carried out his crimes. And it was effectively what he was carrying out with his first victim was stalking. He monitored the movements. He'd worked with her very briefly, so he knew who she was and knew the type of individual she was, knew where she lived. But then there was a amount of planning and premeditation because he wanted to know more about her, he wanted to know her movements, he wanted to get inside the house, he wanted to have a look at every aspect of her life, personally, up close and personal, before he actually committed the crime. And he could walk into her house as her boss without having to explain what he was doing and why he was there. He's got that access very powerful situation where he could access anywhere on the base, anywhere locally, and people wouldn't challenge him. She actually discovered me in the basement. So when she spotted me, I subdued her. Tied her up. That was just the beginning of what was in store for Marie. He took her to the bedroom, and while she lay there, tied up and unable to do anything, he broke the lock in the front door so that no one was going to come in and interrupt them. And when Russell Williams comes back in, he repeatedly must be able to... Well, I saw Kara. I put tape on her mouth, held it there so she couldn't breathe. After Marie's death had occurred, he came off as if he was really upset about it. He even spoke at her funeral and he sent a letter of condolence to her family, signed by him, her commanding officer, saying that Marie would be sorely missed. Colonel Russell Williams of the Canadian Air Force has been questioned for many hours over his suspected involvement in the murder of two young women. He's been facing off against Detective Jim Smith, and his confession is now in full flight. The interviewer has been preparing for this interview for days. Smith has artfully worked Williams into the right mindset, gently encouraging and eloquently enticing him to reveal details of his modus operandi. And Williams's genesis as a killer has been a long time in the making. Before he'd even ended a life, he'd been a prolific burglar who'd also sexually assaulted his victims. He had a twisted fetish for women's underwear, which he stole and kept as trophies. This deviant behavior fueled his perverted fantasies to the point where they became so frenzied that to heighten the risk and the thrill, there was only one place left for him to turn, and that was murder. The first anyone knows about Russell Williams and his dark side is when he moves to Cozy Cove Lane with his wife in 2007. And it's around this time that the town start to see a series of burglaries. This is a story that's tragic for the victims, of course, but it's also a, tr a story that's, that's tragic for Colonel Williams himself, and that this story unfolds in a way that could 
have been stopped at any stage. It, it follows a fairly inevitable psychological unfolding process. Um, so we have Colonel Williams, who I'm sure as a response to the pressures of the authoritarian, institutionalised, disciplinarian lifestyle within the military, starts carrying out the most ridiculous, humiliating, degrading, um, sexual offending behaviours that he almost could possibly dream up. Um, taking pictures, stealing women's underwear and taking pictures of himself in, in women's underwear. I mean, it's almost, uh, in the context of the military man that he is, the man that he is, it's almost uh, the most embarrassing thing he could possibly think of doing if anybody found out about it. It's almost the worst. And I'm sure that's the reason, I'm sure that's what made it so appealing. It's ridiculous and he knew it was and that was why he couldn't stop himself doing it. Did you take anything out of uh, Marie France's house or Jessica Lloyd's house? Uh, yeah, some of their uh, underwear. Information was coming in during the interview because it started off with um, the tire tracks, which is why he'd been arrested in the first place, and then went on to the shoes that he was wearing. Then they went and searched his house and found evidence of uh, the pictures. They found that bags full of underwear, and we're talking of um, some of the region of 1,400 items of um, underwear. He can't explain that. And when they did the checks, they found that that underwear was taken from something like 80 odd houses. So he was taking an average of about 17, 18 pieces of underwear. It will have started to have lost its impact. It's emotionally stimulating effect. It's sexually stimulating effect. It would have been lost. And, and not only is that stimulating effect diminishing rapidly uh, as he starts to do more and more and more burglaries, but also he's developing a sense that he can get away with anything. He's done 82 burglaries and not been caught. He can get away with anything. Escalation is something we, is very common and we see um, in serial sex offenders in particular um, that often start with those lower level offending such as voyeurism or in this case um, you know uh, stealing underwear um, and then that at some point will not be enough will cease to be enough to satisfy a, a fantasy and those fantasies will escalate the scripts will become more um, developed um, and start to move from those non-contact offences to contact offences and then it, it continues and unfortunately for some offenders that escalation will, will not stop until they are stopped by the, the authorities. When they eventually found him, they found him with over 3,000 uh, images of him in different houses wearing underwear of different victims. And later on, when he actually ended up escalating his sexual behaviour to actually a killing the victim, um, he recorded all that, and all that was available for the police once they found him. When I was reviewing this case and looking at the pictures of him in his in the in victim's undergarments, it put me in mind of the photographs that you see okay, from time to time of big game hunters um, with their deceased animal to one side and their huge phallic gun to the other side. And for me, there's something of that in Williams in the parallel of saying, I think it was a trophy room. I think he was a hunter as well. I saw Kara, I put tape on her mouth there, so she now, Michael, if we just stood back from that for a second, if we just literally pause there, we are discussing a man 
who has escalated from wearing women's clothing, undergarments that he collects when he breaks into their homes to now photographing women that he has murdered. And this, and we're talking about how complex he is as an offender, and yet this is a colonel in the Royal Canadian Air Force. So, so he's been able to maintain those two personas. He's been able to act as a high-ranking uh, military officer and engage in, in sensitive missions, mm -hmm. and at the same time, um, to be able to act as an offender and to hold those two things together. You and I know that's not easy. There's leakage, isn't there? There's usually some sense of things aren't quite w right here. Well, he's very skillful in, in terms of being able to maintain it because nobody suspected it until you, you had the tire tracks and the, um, the footprint. Those are the bit that connects it. Otherwise, nobody else uh, thought that it was him. Because partly, again, because how could a high-ranking military officer engage in this activity? There's a disconnect between how you expect somebody in that position to act um, and sort of the linkage with offending behaviour. You don't expect the two to, to go together. With the colonel having confessed to the murder of Marie-France Como, Detective Smith moves on to the disappearance and death of Jessica Lloyd. Um, I saw her in her house. she wasn't um, there Thursday so I got into the house look around and then left noticed she'd come home so I went back in Well, so I raped her in, uh, in her house and then I took her to the car and took her to Tweet. Most people, when they kill, they want to dispose of the victim as quickly as possible. The fact they kept her and then drove back to his cottage. He had a cottage about um, 50 kilometres from the base, so again, he had the privacy um, that he wanted and that allowed him to carry on uh, assaulting her, raping her, uh, and putting her under a tremendous amount of physical and psychological stress. So, Jessica poses for these pictures, and there's videos, and, and then what happens? She thought we were leaving. Hit her on the back of the head. So when you actually do strike her, what, what's the result? Her skull gave way a little bit. She was there and immediately unconscious. What did you hit her with? Flashlight. Oh, there was quite a bit of blood I hadn't expected. Uh, I strangled her. When did you decide to do that? Well, I was uh, pretty sure that I wasn't going to let her leave. He takes her body to a roadside and he dumps it out there. And then he returns home as if nothing has happened. Detective Jim Smith has left Colonel Russell Williams's dark world in ruins. By the end of the interview, he's stripped of his reputation, his military stripes and his freedom. The details of Colonel Russell Williams' vicious murders and sex crimes are amongst the most appalling imaginable. When the audio of his recordings were played in court, they must have been deeply distressing for the loved ones of those he'd murdered. Pleading guilty to two counts of first-degree murder, Williams is now serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole for at least 25 years. But the question still remains, if Williams hadn't been caught, would he have killed again? To answer this, we must return one final time to his extraordinary confession. Can you tell me why you killed her? Do you know why you killed her? Well, because she knew I was taking pictures. 
Well, let me let me ask you this: Did you like or dislike these women? I didn't know any of them. Is what you told me tonight the truth? Yeah. How do you feel about what you've done? Disappointed. If for whatever reason you didn't end up on our on our radar, so to speak, uh, do you think it would have happened again? I was hoping not, but I can't answer the question. Did you like or dislike these women? I didn't know any of them. Would you, in, with your experience, expect somebody with the complex offending behavior that we've been describing, would you have expected him to have stopped killing after he murders Jessica Lloyd, or would he have continued to have killed? He, he would have continued to um, kill. But the leakage that you're talking about, or starting to engage in things that don't apparently seem to make sense, are actually, well, why didn't he take more care with regard to the vehicle? Why did he leave a track? Why did he leave a footprint? Why did he come into the, into the police station wearing the same boots? So all of that is indicative of him beginning to lose control. And that's the leakage that we were discussing earlier, that he can't maintain these two different lives. Because they, serial killers always begin to make a mistake as time progresses. I think he would have gone on to carry on killing because it was, you could see a quite clear escalation from just breaking, well, walking into houses, then breaking into the houses, then having lock picking skills, slowly building up, targeting his victims, and he would have carried on, I think, targeting victims that he has possibly some connection with, uh, and he would have carried on for another few years. And the fact that he actually queries whether he would do it, he's not saying, I. I wouldn't do it. He, he's, he's, uh, he's expressing self-doubt, and I think that's realistic, that he would have um, had self-doubts about his ability to control himself. His last comments that um, this man, this, this beacon of control, of discipline, admitting that he probably couldn't have controlled himself, that he probably would have offended again, um, just totally reveals the way that this drive to do what he did was something apart from him, something that he couldn't contain. Williams is not the same as many offenders that the police face. Um, most offenders, it's a slippery slope. Um, they come into low-level offending and they, they um, uh, progress on to more serious offending, but uh, underlying it all is, is a generally dishonest, a generally um, manipulative, coercive approach to other people. We have the opposite here. Here we have somebody who, whose way of dealing with the, the external world is all about honour and principle uh, and uh, dignity. Um, and what's brought in here is, is a very distinct, very specific um, drive. It, it's not part of a general criminal propensity. Most people find the most difficult aspect, I think, of this offense, why? Um, why would he risk all for something like this? Why could he not have had an affair in which he could have gratified himself in some variation or permutation of that fetishistic need? Uh, why do it this way? So there was an additional element, a dynamic of risk taking, which was fueling something in him, a need in him. He, I understood, one time entered a house naked. Um, this is foolhardy, this is flagrant, and he's, there's an element of this now where he doesn't seem to understand that he has gone beyond the point where he might be able to extract himself with, from this. Um, he's lost control effectively, I think, and uh, inevitably he's caught. What I, th I found quite chilling is when he, he's asked, um, did he like or dislike the women he'd killed? And he just said, I, I didn't know them. them. And it, you just think, wow, I mean, they just were nothing to him. 
And I think that's a, a real glimpse into the, the mindset of somebody who can kill people and just not, not think of them as people. They're not people with lives and families, they're just objects in his fantasy. Colonel Russell Williams was sentenced to life imprisonment. He has no possibility of parole for 25 years. And in one final twist, the military destroyed his medals and burned his uniform to stop them from falling into the hands of ghoulish collectors.